All right, welcome to the um, 12th meeting that we've had now for WARF. Uh, we're going to again go over kind of a brief recap of where we are, a uh, little bit of discussion, and then kind of open up the floor. Uh, this week's agenda is a little bit looser than last week's. Uh, hopefully I won't be talking for the first 25 minutes straight. Um, and we'll dive into things. So uh, in terms of progress and things that are going on right now, uh, there's been a lot of cleanup work going on in a lot of the repositories. Uh, last week, we did mention that uh, the 0.3 release would be coming. Uh, it was released on Friday. Uh, we're already at 3.1 on a couple repositories to add a couple new features. Um, a lot of it being around the unique requirements of the Clios plugin that just came into existence not too long ago. Um, and to add some new kind of UI elements into the fray for other plugin developers to be able to use. So uh, the technical, there is a technical preview of this coming. It is the, it's the UAL replacement effectively. It is the web UI renderer. Um, we have, I, we're at the point now where we have an outline of what it needs to address, and there are some code samples in there already, and we're kind of just molding the, the educational material around it at this point. Um, the goal with this technical preview is going to be to start getting developers involved in an early stage in implementing Wharf as an alternative to whatever it is they are using, whether it's directly with SDKs or whether it's with UAL or if they're still on transit or something else that they have may have written themselves. Um, so the article itself is going to be able to dive into that and show at a very high level how you're going to be integrating um, Wharf, its session kit, the UI render, all of those things into your application with the various wallet plugins. Um, and then hopefully spark some creativity on the developer's part about, oh, um, maybe part of my application could be replaced with a plugin or um, one of the other systems that Wharf is going to be able to offer to them. Um, I guess on that front and in my exploration, I started working on a very early draft PR of Wharf integration for the Open Block Explorer that the Telos crew has been driving for, I don't know how long now, it's been quite a while. Um, but it's a very rudimentary implementation. I, it was UAL, I believe, before this. Um, and so I went in over the course of a couple hours yesterday and um, started removing the UAL code. I kind of broke the whole app and then I started putting Wharf back in its place to, you know, see where there may have been difficulties like connecting things or what capabilities, you know, the application itself expected that Wharf didn't offer. Uh, this spawned a couple new issues on GitHub and a couple feature items that needed to be done. That's actually where this Clios plugin came from. The, the Block Explorer, the Open Block Explorer has uh, kind of these hooks built into it that can make it so that you can log in with Clios effectively. It's not really a login, but more just emulating it. And then at, towards the end, it would show you what you needed to run on the command line to perform the transaction. So really cool use case for power users. Um, and then it was bringing that back and like, how do we make that work with Wharf and how do we make it reproducible? So that way, if some other application wants to go this same route, all they have to do is drop a plugin in. So um, we're planning on doing this a little bit more. It's a really good learning experience. Uh, it's like we're dog fooding the product with other people's products. Um, it is great in the open source world because we can just kind of find other projects to do this with. Um, I just last night, as I was kind of winding down after the day, dove into what Hypho was building and then stumbled into their GitHub and their user experience and just kind of dove a little deep. And that might be another target to do the same kind of thing in. Um, I think we probably will want to make some connections with their team first to not blindside them with this. Um, but it's certainly something that we can do uh, because it's going to be a valuable learning experience for us and a good kickstart for applications like that to start their adoption of this and you know see those kinds of benefits. Um, hopefully, it'll prevent a lot of wheel uh, reinventing. Um, I know pretty much 
every application I've ever worked on, I have to reinvent the same wheels over and over for. And this is, that's one of the big goals with Wharf is to now prevent that. You know, we should be able to create and share those wheels with other applications. So um, I guess before I kind of dive into some of this stuff, was there any, well, that is great to know. Um, Steven in chat, I don't know if chat shows up on these or not, but had just mentioned that you guys are in contact with Haifa. That's correct, yeah. So uh, Adam has a close relationship tracking the program and then um, I'm serving as a product arm uh, accepting milestones. Awesome. Um, I think Adam meets weekly, but uh, yeah, we're happy to make those connections. And I have seen them reaching out in a few uh, different chats across uh, the developer channels, seeking support on some things. And um, yeah, definitely happy to establish those connections as needed. Yeah, that would be awesome if there's, um, I mean, I honestly haven't put much effort into it and I should make that effort to make that connection. But if there's a bridge that you guys can help facilitate, um, it looks like what they're building is awesome. And if there is some way that we can ease that a little bit, you know, with this very focused um, SDK, then I think we're all for it. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe we can chat offline about that and um, yeah. the right person to establish a, a, a warm welcome to. That would be amazing. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, to you guys on the call and to anybody else watching this after the fact, um, if you have applications in the wild that are open source um, that you want someone to look at and um, try to evaluate and maybe spend a couple hours doing a PR to integrate this stuff, it's massively valuable to our team because we get that experience like I was mentioning and hopefully it is a good stepping stone for these developers' applications to be able to leverage this new technology. It's not ready to, like, we're not going to be deploying this live to your application in a week. Um, we're not there yet because the user interface itself still needs to be refined. Um, but at least starting that work now, getting that knowledge sharing going, and um, starting to think about what it is moving forward that you may need that is missing from this framework is so valuable. Um, historically, we did this with Anchor as well. I think that was in mid-2020, maybe 2021. I don't know. It's all a bit of a blur. Um, but we would go out and we'd you know, find applications that were integrating with, uh, I think it was mostly Scatter at that point, um, and find ways that we could like here, this is how you can leverage Anchor and the EOSIO signing request protocol and, you know, work that in to help both the applications support more users and for us to, you know, see what breaks, what doesn't work, where we may have missed, where there's gaps um, in our integration capabilities. So we're doing that same thing here, which is kind of why I bring all of this up. Hopefully it'll lead to, um, you know, kind of a more cohesive client development community, app development community, and um, spawn some great educational materials. So I know I'm taking notes as I go through this, and I've encouraged um, our team to do the same as well. So I guess uh, if you do want to uh, offer something up in that regard for those watching that aren't, you know, able to talk right here, um find us in telegram i think there's a link on the website if there's not uh we should add that otherwise it is the wharf kit telegram channel um it's the same thing as our github it would be this wharf kit string that's what it is on telegram uh and hopefully someday on twitter if uh they ever get their stuff in order and <laughs> we can get that account unbanned essentially i don't know what's going on there another story for another day um, yeah, I figure I'll just kind of stop here again if there was anything else. Cool. I, and I, I did have a question. I didn't know what the flow of the meeting was going to be. Sure. And it was, it was sort of just like more like guidance as developers, you know, what's the guidance on pulling down the packages versus maybe compiling from source. What branches should we be looking at? Um, you know, I've just uh, 
sort of latched on to branches that I think are best in session. And that's what's mm-hmm. worked best for me, but I want to kind of go with the flow. And yeah, I think as of this very moment, uh, the majority of the packages master is now the like what's live. It's the ODAP three version as of Friday. Um, on some of the more active projects, we do have dev branches. Um, none of them are in use right now because we are like all the code that is current is live. It's all the ODAP three branch. Uh, for weeks, we were in this or months even. We were in this phase where we were doing rapid iteration in the development branches. Um, we will have to kind of, I think, maybe standardize that across some of these. Um, But I think at this very moment, it's master. Uh, I think for the session kit, we'll probably get a more regular dev branch running. I think it already exists. Oh, it defaults to dev. Um, A lot of this, I think you're highlighting an issue here where there might be some inconsistencies between the various repositories. Um, But I would say if you're going to do a PR, just do whatever it defaults to as the branch itself. And if it needs to be corrected, we can correct it. All right. And then, um, yeah, I, I, I also tried pulling the packages down to develop against, like just develop without make, trying to make any changes. And that seems to work fine. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that was my main question. Is there any reason we should just build from source rather than pulling the packages down? I would say, like, if you're just trying to integrate into an application, just use NPM, Yarn, whatever you use, and pull it down from package managers. Um, at this phase of things, the quote unquote, what is it, the release branch or the latest branch? Um, let's see what they call it. Oh, that went to GitHub. I should look before I click. Uh, that's JS Deliver. That's not Wharf Kit. Everything's on NPM. Obviously, you can find it. Um, but the latest versions are all going to be current right now. So if you just NPM install these, it will uh, pull down whatever the most recent functional build is. We're moving pretty quick and breaking things as we're going along right now. But the things you get from NPM should be passing all of the unit tests, should have had at least a rudimentary check done against them, um, and would be good for uh, publishing. There may be other tags, like for the longest time we used this UI tag. You can see there were so many UI tag branches. Uh, that was because we just didn't want to break uh, the latest release with some of these UI releases. But yeah, it was two months ago that we went to ODAT 2. I know, it's like a lifetime ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I haven't had any problem using um, package managers to pull them down. So Awesome. Cool, cool. And hopefully, like I guess in terms of versioning right now, for anybody that is interested, we're using the minor version like it is a major version right now. So if you go from 0.2 to 0.3, it may have breaking changes. But if we increment the last digit, there will be no breaking changes. So once we hit the 1.0 phase, you know, like where we're actually, it's a functional product we'd encourage you to use in production. We'll actually follow Semver, and um, breaking changes will only come in the appropriate places. So just as a caveat to how they're being released right now. <laughs> cool. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions or anything kind of as I move through what's happened in the last week or so. Um, I this meeting is a little bit less structured than some of the ones we've had previously. Like I, I don't have an absolute set agenda besides covering the updates and then fostering a discussion here about like what may be needed or um, what may need to be changed out of these kits. Um, so yeah, I guess kind of just diving into it. Um, I mentioned already we've upgraded all of these to O.3. That's what why all of them were updated five days ago. I think it was last Friday afternoon that we actually got all of those releases out. The one thing that we haven't released yet is the Anchor plugin. Um, 
Anchor is probably one of the more complex plugins we've built at this point. Uh, it is a replacement for the Anchor Link repository, which was our entire SDK. Um, it encompasses all of that and then offloads some of the duty out to the session kit and the web UI renderer. So it's been a, a reimagining and a breaking of that apart. Um, we're also talking right now about having a abstract wallet plugin for the EOS IO signing request protocol um, that is going to take some of the code out of the Anchor plugin and um, make it so other wallets can use it as well. I'm pretty sure the Seeds wallet uh, or the Hyphal wallet, I'm not sure there's a difference there or what they're calling it these days. Um, they also use ESR, so them having access to that abstraction would like really ease development purposes for their own plugin. Um, the Proton Wallet uses it, Wombat uses it. So there's a deep shared component that's being developed right in the Anchor plugin that once it's functional, we'll extract. Um, it's close. There's uh, there's something going on with the UUIDs, we think, that's preventing iOS sessions from working, but it actually works really well on desktop and Android at this point. Um, so I we talked about that in our developer meeting last night. I'm hoping for updates on that today or maybe tomorrow. Um, and then we'll be finally doing a release of the Anchor plugin itself. Um, it is, I think, functional here. Nope, this version is not functional with it. Um, it's supposed to pop up with the QR code, the clickable link, establish that session, do that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I guess that's just an update on from last week. I said I think we would have it done by Friday. The Anchor plugin is still not done at this point. We're pushing along with it. It's all happening in the uh, one of these other branches and in, I think, the only real PR that's going on. It's this one right here. Daniel on our team has been working on that for I don't know, like two weeks now. And you can see this pull request is just lit up with stuff going on. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll be out soon. We'll have that baked into the web UI renderer test that's uh, available up there. Um, and until then, uh, we're just kind of moving along with the other plugins that exist. I showed this in Telegram. Uh, this, and I talked about this a little bit ago, this Cleos plugin. It is integrated into the UI test at this point. Actually, if I go to uitestwarfkit.com, pretty sure it's deployed out here. Yep. So again, this is a power user tool, but for those of us that need it for, I don't know, MSIG tools or something really important, it's available to use. You're able to pick a network. You're able to put in an account name. It looks up the permissions, and you can select an account name. And whenever you perform transactions, it gives you the command to run in Cleos to actually perform that. So it's copy to clipboard command to copy it over. Um, this design I passed to our designers last night. I've already got some rough drafts back. Um, so this will be looking a little bit better in the future. I, Jesse and I talked a little bit about it last night, uh, about some suggestions about how maybe we could even uh, improve the elements that are being shown here. I pass those along to the designers as well, and they're uh, thinking about how we can potentially make this uh, these types of elements a better user experience. Because while we're using it for the Cleos plugin, like this text box is a programmable element in WarfKit now that wallet plugins or transact plugins or whatever can pass raw data to an unlimited amount of raw data that it's meant to be copied out by the user. Don't know what other use cases it might have yet, but it is a component that will be globally available for stuff like this and um, just there for whoever's developing a plugin that needs to use it. Um, hopefully, there'll be a way to maybe expand it in the future so you can actually see everything. Um, and yeah, we'll get that in with the major design that's major redesign that's coming out hopefully in the next couple weeks. Um, other than that, uh, there are lots of minor tweaks that are going on in the session kit. There was some updates that allowed the Cleos plugin to work. Uh, we've continued on translating most of these plugins. Uh, our translation pipeline is getting set up so we can automate and manage these a lot better. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I think most of the coding right now, since we last talked, has gone into the Anchor plugin, this new wallet plugin. 
and uh, just general kind of cleanup and the release of O.3, which we'll be doing the blogging about. So again, I don't have a super heavy agenda for this meeting, um, except for progress on this. Um, I guess one other thing to note is, is that the web UI renderer we're integrating Storybook into, which is a UI component design tool. Uh, there will be, like, we have this running on uitest.worfkit.com. There will be a storybook.worfkit.com as well that you will be able to see and help tweak, or developers will be able to, uh, all of the user interface components of Worf. Like, it will be used for responsiveness testing, resizing, um, fonts, positioning, localization, all of the design considerations that go into like this micro application that people um, use within their products. So that'll be a live demo. It'll follow master. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to give a greater insight into how these things are built and get people involved in potentially modifying it. Like, we're really, again, focused on the developer experience at this point, um, trying to make it so this is the most extensible thing possible um that's welcoming to come in and help contribute to so uh as far as ui designs uh, i know a couple weeks ago i had talked about those being available um i could show some of them we previewed them in one of our blog posts uh, i don't even know the best way to share those at the moment kind of looking real quick I guess I could just share my Figma window instead of the browser window. That's probably the best way to go for it. Uh, as soon as I can find it, we have so many Figma files. Wharf. All right, let me switch that over. All right, this is not it. This was me drawing an Aaron's drafts. Session kit UI. Um, oh, it looks like Dean's in here working on something. Um, where to even start? There's a lot of templating going on about button states. And this is the kind of stuff you're going to find in Storybook, um, where we actually have uh, very defined ways that elements should be described and displayed to the users. Uh, it'll all be standardized so that way, for those using the base UI, if you add a checkbox through a plugin, because this is all done programmatically through a plugin, like you specify, I want a checkbox and I want some text that says this. And then when the user checks the checkbox, you provide a callback. Um, so that way, you're not actually writing the HTML. You're not injecting it into the page. The entire plugin architecture just gives you the options to generate these. Um, this is what these templates are going to come in useful for. Like You say you want a checkbox, and you will get these checkbox states, these checkbox styles, and it'll all be unified into the Wharf uh, style, effectively. And like I described last week and probably before that, if you want to build your own user interface as an application developer, you are absolutely welcome to do so. Um, it's going to take effort. You're going to have to implement the user interface standards. You're going to have to uh, be able to react to all of the situations that the base UI renderer follows. Um, but totally possible. If you want that absolutely immersive experience, it'll just be replacing a plugin that you would develop with you know, replacing our plugin with the one you develop. That's about it. You'd have to kind of make all of this on your own. Um, but diving kind of back towards the design, some elements we had. Not sure what that is. Max likes to kind of create it like a use it like a giant whiteboard, which is fun, but also makes it hard to navigate in some of this. Um, this is kind of the fun animation direction we're kind of heading right now. Um, this may actually be subtly animated if we're kind of playing with this at this point. It, it might animate while there is things in progress or be 
I think there's another one over here, or be flat if it is just like awaiting you. Or we haven't implemented that yet or played with that yet, but we were looking at the um, the Web3 model that uh, the Ethereum and the Wallet Connect communities have built, and they have had so much fun with their um, their colorful displays and just attention grabbing elements and things like that, that we wanted to try to implement some of that within Wharf as well. Um, we may make it so that you can disable it. So that way, like this would never exist and it's just gonna kind of be a boring border. Totally fine. Maybe you don't want that. Maybe it clashes with your design um, and you don't wanna build your own whole user interface. Then there's options to like tame the one that we may build. Um, but we are trying to be subtle in a lot of this. We don't want it to be too distracting. Um, but throughout all of these designs, you're going to see that they're very generic. And it's because, again, we're developing the, the elements that developers are going to be able to use. Like, this is things that a plugin will describe, not Wharf. So we may have some of these that Wharf can describe, but not all of them. Um, a lot of this is still very much in flux. So again, not final. We're like, I think right now we're storybooking out the header elements and the buttons and the topography and a few things like that. But um, we don't know how it's all going to fit exactly together. But hopefully this goes to show that like there's some kind of neat design in progress. This is actually the dark mode version where the header is the only thing that's light and the body is what's dark. Uh, whereas this is the inverted version. Uh, the UI kit's going to detect whether you're in light mode or dark mode based on your OS preferences and automatically set that. Um, I know as developers, we're nerds about wanting our dark mode because our eyeballs are always in pain, but that'll be a part of the Wharf kit uh, UI renderer. You know, you know, I've mentioned in the past, you can kind of see some of the design coming through and some of the iterations. Like This looks like the error message we have today, except it's not fully rendered out like this. It's not as crisp. It's not as clean. Um, we have mock-ups for what QRs look like with the buttons below them. This would look very similar to what you'd expect out of Anchor Link today. We wanted to be able to programmatically recreate that in WarfKit, so we kind of took the elements and put them in place. This is actually, it doesn't look as nice, but it is what the Anchor plugin renders these days. Um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, it will actually look like this as well. We have so many button states. Uh, there's the light mode version of it. Uh, they're all on just kind of crazy textured backgrounds, uh, apparently of waves because we have a nautical theme going on. Um, but just to show how hopefully the colors aren't going to conflict with other more drastic things in the background. Uh, I think I was, those are... um, I was wondering if in that screen that pops up with the QR code, you could mm -hmm. add like a checkbox that is, you know, per site. So maybe just like add a cookie or something that will just say uh, automatically open, you know, anchor desktop or automatically open whatever the ESR handler and don't show me again. Because for in our case, most of the users are, you know, like desktop users mm -hmm. and we don't even support like on UX network, for example, mobile yet. Yep. So uh, for us, the user can choose, say he's on his desktop. He's gonna, he can choose that, you know, uh, I never wanna see this kind of message again for this website. And then, you know, if he really needs to see it again, he can just kind of delete the cookie or, you know, like, I don't know, or like, I don't think it should be part of the wallet inside because it's gonna right. be on the site cookie as, you know, relevant to that kind of uh, browser and that uh, specific uh, computer. Yeah, uh, we have talked about that. I don't know if I see any, designs related to that. Um, maybe? Nope. Um, what we're talking about is there potentially being kind of a settings menu. We, What you're describing is something we want to be able to do, because we it should also remember the, like, the user's wallet choice. Not, not even like how they want to use the wallet, but like let's say you offer four wallets and the user always just wants to use one. It could remember that. But then how do you go and make it undo that remembering so that screen pops up? So right now, kind of what we're talking about is for maybe there to be a settings menu to be able to modify that. Uh, if you were to click on the logo in the top right, kind of like a secret menu, um, or maybe not so secret. We, again, haven't gotten super deep into this, but 
Um, the ability to remember things like that in Worf is going to be important. So I guess the answer is yes, in a really long roundabout way of saying that. Because if uh, like, you know, uh, an app requires like a lot of interaction, it's, you know, it's an extra click that's like, yeah. especially if you enable eventually some type of whitelisting or something, Yep. Uh, you know, then you, you definitely don't want to have any like extra friction. Yep. Like this. This is actually the reason we started um, talking about it was like we did that. We did the power up plugin and we did the uh, fuel plugin and the autocorrect plugin. And the fees were all so tiny that like they almost weren't even showing a click for. So again, another kind of remember me, the persistent state of Wharf. Um, we needed it for this auto approve. And you know, we can make it so that by default it pops up with the fee to complete a transaction. Maybe you need to buy more RAM or something for the transaction to complete. The user could then just say automatically approve this transaction. Uh, I don't know, like ignore the content side of this, but you'd be able to say yes, like I want to accept small fees like this, and then this screen would no longer pop up. And in your wallet, obviously, it's going to display it. It's going to be like, there's a token transfer here to pay this fee. Um, but we don't need to prompt you every time for it in here. And this is another one of those persistent state components that we want to be able to add in. I don't know. And that would be at the wallet level, right? This is not at the site level. This would be at the site level. OK, but the data is stored in the wallet that, that kind of tracks that, or it will be stored like this is just like as Worf running on a on a on a site, so it's like stored as mm -hmm. cookies, or is it stored in your actual wallet? Stored on the site. Got it. So it'll probably be in like local storage or something like that. Yeah. Some sort of like preferences JSON object or something like that, and then you know. Again, if you ever wanted to undo that, we would have like a menu somewhere that you could then open, and then it would show all of the things that you wanted to remember in the past. Or maybe if you log out and log back in, then it will, I don't know, maybe it would persist, maybe it wouldn't. I guess we haven't really discussed that yet. But there's, there's a couple instances now where we've run into where user state is something we're going to be able to want to persist. And then one level higher than that, the developer should also be able to specify what the default state for those components is as well. You know, like in your case, you described yes. that you didn't want, like mobile's not supported, so let's hide the QR code by default. Like that should be just a flag. You and eliminate specify. the whole screen, you know, for example. Yeah. So it's just like you click like accept or send or transfer or prove or what, what, what may have you. It yep. just like automatically pops up your anchor or your ESR handler and everything's good to go. Yep, exactly. So yeah, so, go for it. Yeah, it, it's tough, right? Because you don't really have a backend account service for it. So I would suggest just store it in the session for the site. And then maybe there's a plugin we can develop later on where people can replicate that, store it in uh, their own service that's associated with that yeah so absolutely i mean it's, 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 yeah the only issue for unicode is how i, I or, or wharf is how much you want to deal with the cross device issues i think i think that would be the bigger one in but i think at this level it's at the site level so it's at the browser level actually mm -hmm. so meaning there is no cross browser, cross user, like uh, like uh, like, or at least like cross devices. Because as far as uh, the you know the browser is concerned, it's a different browser, it's a different computer. Uh, there's not going to be a link without running like you know some type of backend aggregation, which is very problematic in a wallet, you know, for privacy reasons. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was saying. That it should be at the session unless you deem that cross device is super important and then you need to solve it. Correct. And this, and this stuff, what, I mean, the, there's a whole wallet and that's wallet stuff, but there's a whole session with session stuff. So, you know, yeah. we, we, 
we don't have just there's not just a wallet option for storing. There's sort of a gradient of storage solutions, or there's a gradient of state management solutions, I should say. Yeah, and I think in this instance, each device is considered its own session uh, to your wallet. Um, so yeah, there's no synchronization of that kind, but there is definitely a need for that kind of uh, synchronization, maybe at some point. Uh, one, this is kind of veering out of wharf territory, but um, like one thing we've always really wanted to do with Unicove was have a contact system. So that way you can have a list of contacts. And it's like, well, where do you store that? Like if I go log in at a new computer, my contacts aren't going to be there because Wharf is a DAP and everything is in that one session in that browser. So the solution there is at some point having some sort of state management at the wallet level that can pass state down to the application. And in that instance, you know, your wallet would, for this contact list idea, it would be that your contacts are saved in your wallet and there is some sort of protocol that in the future that state could then be replicated down to any dap you use um, there's a whole host of privacy and security concerns with that you know if you log into some random dap you don't want to share your whole contact list um, but that's really to keep the dap kind of uh, long-term stateless the solution that would be needed and i think that wharf if that technology existed wharf could potentially persist state in that same way um, but we're going to need wallets to adhere to some sort of state synchronization standard that's not on chain, so it's not wasting chain resources. Um, and it's also more private because it literally is your device and it's not on a public chain. So there's a lot of problems to solve there. I think maybe in the future we could get to some of that. Um, but as it stands now, just like with the contact list idea, it's it's all going to just exist on each device that you log into. Cool. Um, uh, these were, I think it looks like these are already some of the designs coming in from the Clio's plugin. Um, again, I don't have a formal presentation of all of this user interface, but I do this quite regularly where I just kind of surf around in our Figma and look at those who are working on it, uh, taking these and implementing them. You'll start seeing a lot of this in Storyboard as soon as we do that first publish, uh, which is hopefully not too far in the distant future. I don't know what this mess is, but um, <laughs> looks like just various button states. Uh, Lots of exploration going on on how we present wallets. Um, I guess overall, though, I mean, uh, is, do you guys have any thoughts or feedback on like where the design direction is heading? Is are we getting too extreme on how like the fun? Like I think that's something I'm worried about. Too much fun. Yeah. yeah right. I suppose mean, the bad thing. I, I I did have a quick question that I dropped yeah. in the chat, which was just. Um, as you guys are moving along, whether or not you guys are also just kind of staying a step ahead of like accessibility requirements and stuff. Uh, not that I own the requirements of this in any capacity. I just have an awareness that there are some good add-ons that exist for stuff like Storybook. And especially if this is kind of the base of where people may be starting, of course, we'd want to have all that stuff accounted for so that people don't have to worry about it if they don't have to. Yeah. Are you talking about like the area and like like ARIA requirements and like the for text readers and like accessibility, that kind of accessibility. Yeah, and even just things like uh, like sufficient contrast so that there's like enough aliasing so that people with uh, like visual impairments at some capacity can still navigate the UI successfully. Um, I I'm I'm not seeing anything that's jumping out at at me as like problematic, but I'm also. Uh, non-designer colorblind person so i i wouldn't be the best person to opine i just figured i would ask since it's one of those kind of gotchas that can really add up a lot of work at the last if it's not something that's kind of kept at bay the entire time yeah i can say we have a couple colorblind people variations of colorblind people on the team um and it's come up 
uh, throughout the past couple of months about making sure that that is accounted for. Um, I don't know that we have any tools baked in. Uh, it looks like the one you shared though would be really cool to add in just as like a checking for that. Um, yeah, it, it's great at screening and surfacing those sorts of things. Um, not that I've spent a lot of time in Storybook, but the times that I have collaborated with others, they have celebrated that add-on in particular. Awesome. I will definitely share that with the team. Um, but I, I guess as a short answer to the question, though, we're definitely uh, talking about that and keeping it in consideration as we move along through the project. Um, and just last night in our dev call, we were talking about uh, screen readers as well as uh, keyboard controls. So that way, you know, people who can't use a mouse or are using a screen reader or some other alternative input device can still interact with these. Obviously, we can't control the application behind Wharf that they may be using, but if that application does support it and is like fully accessible to all input types, it would really be unfortunate if our interface then did not. So we want to make sure that we are, even if the applications themselves are not. And keyboard support is like just power users as well. You know, try to avoid yep. the mouse as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah, especially for us developers. <laughs> yeah, I had a question about the list of wallets. Uh huh. Um, are you gonna group them by protocol? Because it can get confusing. For example, if you know, like, say there's three that are using ESR protocol, and even if you click on a different one, right, than the one you have installed or the one you have last opened in a way, because that's the one that's gonna auto register as the default like uh, os uh, handler for that then you know somebody might click on you know like say another wallet but it will still open it will open a different wallet whatever is the mm -hmm. esr handler so shouldn't it be more grouped by like protocol almost like you know say you have anchor and any other esr is almost like overlapping in a i don't know like some design and you click on one or is there more to it that maybe you click the wallet and then it offers you to download it or something to that effect? Yeah, uh, we have started addressing that in some ways. Uh, I don't know that I have anything that shows it. Um, what we're planning on doing in, I don't even, there's a copy link. There's no open link. Uh, I don't have a visual aid, but I'll just describe it. Um, we do want there to be one button that just says open default. And that would trigger, you know, let's say we hit a point where the vast majority of wallets in the ecosystem are all supporting that to trigger logins. Um, there would be like a, you know, open wallet button that's super generic, and that's what would trigger the ESR colon uh, protocol handler. And then if for whatever reason people want to open a specific wallet, there would be like a... Uh, a button below it or maybe a small text link or something else that people could click that says select a specific wallet and then it would prompt all of the ESR compatible wallets and each one of them would have their own protocol specific URI. Uh, we right now I think all but iOS supports uh, the ESR dash anchor colon as the handler there um, and we expect that will be the Chrome. Chrome add-ons, I think, also don't support it. I think they need to be web plus, uh, like a prefix, or yeah. else considered like insecure. Yeah, I think so. Um, there's so much changing in that front; it's hard to keep up on. Um, but we do want to make it so that like there's a default option, and then there are specific options for each wallet. So like every wallet would all register with ESR you know, just a base one, or maybe it's web ESR, maybe we move forward and kind of change that so that way it's more accessible. Um, and then if it didn't do what the user expected it to do, then there's a more options, you know, that you could go in and you'd be like, well, I specifically meant I wanted to open Anchor or I wanted to open Proton Wallet or whatever wallet it may be that handles the ESR protocol, but your operating system doesn't recognize that as the default. Uh, it's super problematic. And it's, almost like, and it's almost like difficult to to prompt the user in in the sense even of the wallet. Like say, you know, say uh, like I tried to play around with this ESR uh, protocol, 
And like say you're doing something in Electron, if I open what I'm doing, then automatically all ESR, li ESR links are you know, associated to, 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 to whatever I'm building versus mm -hmm. to Anchor. And it's almost like, because you have to kind of register the protocol through, you know, through when opening the wallet, as part of opening the wallet. And then it's kind of like, it's, it doesn't even give the user, like I know in Windows, for example, usually they tell you, oh, like there's an extension, you know, or a protocol changing. Do you want this to be the default handler? But at least on Mac OS, I, I didn't see that as, you know, yeah. as an option. And definitely the average Mac user is not going to know how to change the default. No. You have to obviously open like the app itself and like say, you know, you open anchor, then it becomes automatically the default. Yep. And I mean, to edit them on Mac OS, for example, you have to open Xcode and edit a plist file. And I think in yeah. Windows, you need to edit the registry. It's really not um, intuitive. intuitive. I can say from a development perspective, like if you were working on something like that, um, one thing that Anchor does when you're in development mode is when you start it, it does register the protocol handler, but when you quit in development mode, it automatically unregisters the protocol handler. So that way Anchor falls back to being the default. I know that was a huge headache for us early on in development until we added something like that in. Um, you have to run different versions and test, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So unregistering on close in a development environment is kind of one of the big helpers in that sense. Um, we need a lot of, I wish that the OS environment would move to something like deep links, like that would solve a lot of our problems. Hopefully in the coming years that actually happens so we can stop using uh, custom URI schemes, but <laughs> it's- to deal with the reality. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like it's this kind of old piece of tech that it feels like, on desktop at least, has not moved forward all that fast. But definitely a problem there. Hopefully we can solve it with some of this UI stuff and by having each wallet have their own handler. Um, and then kind of going back to the idea of preferences, uh, we could then remember if the user in that specific application chose a specific wallet and that could then be the default you know if they clicked use other wallet they clicked anchor or whatever other wallet for example then we know in the future when we render those types of links we should use anchor dash or esr dash anchor as the clickable protocol link as opposed to just esr which who knows what's going to handle that that makes a lot of sense uh, like each one having you know two protocol handlers one so that you know the one button works for for sites to support like many wallets, as well as the ability to you know choose a specific one if one you know wants to. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully, I we like I kind of mentioned uh, Android and desktop currently support ESR dash Anchor and iOS. We have in dev right now supporting ESR dash Anchor. Um, and then once we get that in, we'll be adding that for our instance, for our plugin of WORF and the session kit. And then as we start releasing this, we'll be reaching out to other wallets and saying, hey, you know, like we know you handle the ESR protocol. Also do ESR dash your wallet name um, and maybe also do like web plus uh, your protocol name so that way you know like maybe we can follow that standard let's get ahead of the game when it comes to how we handle these requests um, and maybe publish some sort of standard for you know if you are a wallet that's using the signing request protocol like register these two three four things as your handler so that way moving forward your users can take advantage of that and have a better user experience yeah that sounds perfect Cool. Um, any, I guess, other design thoughts, considerations, questions about what we've talked about today? I know we're is coming gonna up be, against the hour. Is there going to be any theming for the design? I might have missed it, but like just color choices and things of the sort. Uh, just light and dark mode for now. Okay. Um, kind of showing the inversion of colors. Um, we could potentially get into theming in the future, but I think that might fall out of scope, at least right now. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. And colors, I don't think, are 
completely finalized yet. I'm kind of back and forth on this pale green and <laughs> we're, we're still very much in progress, but at least you can kind of see the shapes and things coming together now. I'm a big fan of the dark mode right now. And by theme file, I meant more like clearly just like, you know, like a, a file that like you can add and it's just, you know, it lists like the different colors for, you know, primary, secondary, whatever it is, like the different colors used. And then, you know, you can just kind of use your own version that like more matches, you know, a certain like gap. Yeah, I, I think that would be possible. Um, I'm not sure how we pull it off yet, but I know that everything we have is themed out as far as um, SAS variables go. So maybe that's a possibility in the future. Yeah, at least the, the browser could override it. Uh, yep. Override it, yeah. Well, we are operating in a shadow DOM right now. So oh, yeah. parent so styles be, uh, aren't good. Yeah. It'll have to be something that's injected into the shadow root itself. Yeah. So we might have to do that. Well, yeah. the parent app might be able to do that too, but we'll see. There is restrictions. Uh, I've done stuff like that before, and I remember there's some restrictions on what you could and can't do. Yep. Yeah, those shadow roots are specifically meant to help protect whatever is in that little container. So hopefully that way it doesn't things don't bleed in or out and affect each other. And it can kind of be this nice standardized experience. Cool. Um, well, I guess to kind of close things out, uh, the big things to expect in the coming week or so are is that technical preview we talked about, um, the Anchor plugin, which will be made available. Uh, we will probably continue to start exploring and start like tinkering with external applications. Um, we will be writing the UI specification document, which I think is one of the last uh, line items for one of our next milestones. Um, and starting to get some real translations in place. So, And then we're going to be going through this somewhat uh, multi-week phase of trying to work with developers, get feedback, and make sure that this is actually uh, compatible and what developers need and be able to make changes before we try to encourage people to actually use it. So yeah, that's kind of a brief summary of what's coming up. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, all right, either. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to drop off. Sounds Lots great. Thanks for nice. joining. All right, I'm going to end the recording here.